tuning in. Um, today I'm doing another video in my series on beginner's guide to various aspects of classical music. And today I want to talk about orchestral music. Uh, so you might have seen some of my other videos, a beginner's guide to opera and a beginner's guide to new music. This one I'm doing a quick um, summation of orchestral music. So from the beginning of the orchestra through to the present day, and I've got a list of some suggested listening. I'm not necessarily gonna talk about the history of the orchestra because there's lots of other great content that does that better than I can. Um, one example that I will link in the playlist will be um, a two-part video from Piano TV where they talk about the instruments, the makeup of the orchestra and how that has changed over time. I'm gonna to touch on that a little bit, but I'm mostly just gonna talk about um, composers that I like from different periods and give you a, a piece to, a suggested piece to listen to. So a broad kind of history of the orchestra means a broad kind of history of classical music. So you might've seen um, some explanation of that in my new music video um, to put new music in context. But for this one, um, uh, a broad idea of, a broad history of classical music would be uh, around um, the uh, Middle Ages, music was mostly contained in Europe, we're talking about here as well, Western classical music. Um, music was mostly performed by choirs in churches and any kind of instrumental music was probably slightly secondary to that. So you would have perhaps in churches, maybe an organ or um, a small group of instruments that would assist in performances in churches. And then outside of that, there would be instrument playing in like folk music contexts. So, you know, like say a fiddler at a wedding, that sort of thing. And there may be uh, some instruments that were used for more occasional music. So say like um, trumpets to uh, perform for the entrance of the king or hunting horns that were used by hunting. So the music is more kind of um, rudimentary. And then as we move into the Renaissance period, those uh, instruments are brought together more often. Um, they might be used to create more dance music, and that becomes a big aspect of the development of Western classical music. Um, there may be instruments that are used to accompany the church singing and they get more larger and more complex. And of course, that's caught up with technology. As technology develops, the, the quality of the instruments develop really important um, aspect is organs. Uh, organs be become more technologically proficient and uh, become a huge part of church music and within that community music making. And so the, the organ is really like central to a lot of um, music, say in the Renaissance and um, the early Baroque period. So the Baroque period comes after the Renaissance and before classical music. And it's generally defined as being music that was written up until uh, J.S. Bach, who uh, many of you may know as the sort of grandpapa of classical music. So I wanted to include one piece that was pre-Bach, um, and this discussion is really, uh, I've kind of split it in two. You've got old stuff and you've got newish stuff. And by newish, I mean like 20th century and 21st century music. So the first work is the prelude to the opera L'Orfeo by Monteverdi, Claudio Monteverdi, an Italian composer. Often uh, this piece is considered the very first opera that was written. And so this is the piece of instrumental prelude music at the beginning. What is really cool about this is obviously it's the first opera, so it's like very dramatic and it's a piece of theater. Um, but in terms of the orchestra, what's really interesting is that Monteverdi uses a large group of instruments, trumpets, um, what are called sackbuts, which look like trombones. They're an early type of trombone, but they're less um, big and loud and brassy than the modern trombone. They're more uh, light and um, subtle. Um, he uses an organ. He uses stringed instruments, you know, violins, cellos. Um, there are fiorbos and lutes, so like early 
uh, guitar-like instruments. There are harps. Um, so there's this really interesting mix of instruments um, and you really have an orchestra and, or a group of musicians that is not, um, that doesn't look anything like the contemporary modern um, orchestra. That rises, that, that trend for the modern orchestra, the way it looks and the makeup of the instruments of the modern orchestra, comes about around Bach's time, but really gets um, solidified and established with an orchestra that Joseph Haydn um, was involved in called the Mannheim Orchestra. And I believe that's around 17, the late, the late 1700s. I'm not sure of the exact um, time that that happened. And that orchestra was so good and successful and the makeup of the orchestra, so predominantly string instruments with some woodwinds and brass and timpani, which are drums, kettle drums, they're called in America. Uh, that success of that orchestra uh, inspired other cities and of course, rich princes and kings uh, who were impressed by the quality and the sound of this orchestra to create their own. And then of course, composers were, um, uh, they were essentially servants in those days, so they were basically paid and told to write for what we call the Mannheim Orchestra. Anyway, so pre-Mannheim Orchestra, the piece, um, the Monteverdi piece, is really dramatic and brassy and loud, and it is heralding the beginning of a very long and very beautiful opera. And you know, it's telling uh, it's telling you to sit down, shut up, and pay attention to the to the drama that is about to take place. The next work I want to include is similar in that way. It is um, not a theatre piece, but it is a work that is a narrative piece. It is by Johann Sebastian Bach, and it is the opening to the St. John Passion from 1724. So we're jumping from Monteverdi in 1607 to Bach in 1724. Bach, of course, is a famous German composer. He wrote so much music that is... Um, identifiable and has been on every piece of modern media from car ads to movies to everywhere. You would not, certainly know some of the music. This piece, um, A Passion, was a work written uh, to be performed in a church uh, by usually a choir and an orchestra, uh, but also it would include the local um, congregation singing um, hymns that they know, and those hymns are distributed throughout the piece. So the piece is telling the story of uh, Jesus Christ um, from the St. John telling of that. So it is slightly, not theatrical, but it's, it's certainly a storytelling work. Uh, and throughout the piece, the congregation would sing and join in with the choir and the orchestra singing the chorales, um, the, the hymns that they knew. So there's also um, a level of community music making that is important to it. The, I'm including this piece because it is really, really cool music. Um, Bach, as I said, was so important as a composer. He basically solidified um, the way that music was communicated in um, the score. Prior to Bach's time, the musical score, um, and during Bach's time too, and a little bit later, but, but before that, musicians had to have an understanding of improvising and making up music. And the score didn't necessarily contain all the information that um, it does nowadays. Uh, so with Bach, um, there is, um, if you are a person who studies early music, you learn the skills around improvising and those are definitely in Bach. If you play Bach, sing Bach, there is an element of the improvisation that is still um, a part of doing that music, but it is more a list of instructions than the music that came before it. It is more specific to what Bach wanted. So I'm including that because it's kind of a, a turning point in Western art music from music that is perhaps grounded more in improvisation um, and an understanding of um, music that was communicated orally uh, through teachers rather than notated music. <laughs> 
So we then move into the kind of um, golden era of, of classical music, Mozart and Beethoven. So I've included, of course, a work by Mozart. I've included his clarinet concerto from 1791. A concerto is a work that is written for an orchestra with a solo performer. So it's generally written for a virtuoso, so a person who is um, exemplary at their instrument or as a singer. So it could be piano, it could be clarinet in this instance, it could be a violin. Uh, and it's uh, in those days, it's, it's usually a wind or a string instrument. Um, and then as we move into the 19th century, the concerto really becomes um, almost an obsession to be violin, piano, and sometimes cello. And there is a, a huge amount of concertos written for those instruments. It's sort of, um, there's a lot less written for say an oboe or a clarinet or um, a bassoon or a trombone. So um, I've included a concerto here by Mozart. It is a beautiful, stunning piece of music and it is very famous, you probably know it. Concertos generally fall into three movements, the first being fast, the second being slow, and the third being fast again, and more kind of um, joyous and, and with a sense of finality about it. Symphonies um, are generally in four movements. Uh, the structure varies, but generally it's a fast movement, then perhaps a movement that would include a slow movement, then a movement that ha explores dance-like rhythms and is a bit more um, light-hearted. And then the final movement is generally fast again, and it may be um, triumphant, or it may be in some instances, it can be kind of um, uh, a bit sad. So with that in mind, with the symphony, um, the next work I suggest would be Ludwig van Beethoven, the famous German composer. We are in the year celebrating 250 years of his birth. Um, I've included his third symphony, the Eroica Symphony from 1803. The Eroica is a long work and it's important partly because it is much longer than any other symphony was preceding it. And it also contains within it a lot of technological advances for the orchestra. Um, the, the, that includes new instruments were included, like adaptations to horns that Beethoven writes for, but also the ability and the technical proficiency of playing instruments develops over time. And that is reflected in Beethoven's work. He really starts to push the um, level of playing required by orchestral musicians um, in Eroica, and that's to do with the music that they're playing, but also the length. A lot of um, symphonies prior to that are only, say, 20 minutes long, and that has a lot to do with the time and skill of the musician and the, the time that instruments would remain in tune and wouldn't, um, wouldn't literally fall apart in some instances. Uh, Beethoven is, uh, there's more technological advances and so he pushes the length of the work um, to be sometimes in some versions up to an hour long of the Eroica Symphony. Beethoven's really important because he, like Bach, is a very transitional figure. Um, Bach, as I said, uh, really worked to create a solid framework for music to be created in. Um, Haydn grew on that, Mozart certainly um, grew on that, and then Beethoven takes what Haydn and Mozart establish in the classical era and start to push it with these technological advances. With social changes, Beethoven becomes a freelance musician while Mozart was a servant musician, um, and Beethoven really pushes us into what we call the Romantic era, where it's less about writing music um, for a king or a prince or uh, for the church and it's more about Beethoven wanting to write music for themselves, um, for specific lovers or collaborators or musicians. Certainly the church and rich people were still there paying them to create music in their name um, but there's more of a push to the individual artist. The next example it comes from the early Romantic period uh, from Felix Mendelssohn. It's his fifth symphony from 1830, uh, which is not a hugely famous work. It's like um, not, you know, going to be in the top 10 orchestral pieces. And that's partly why I wanted to include it, to 
introduce it, um, this work to an audience that might not necessarily ever get the chance to listen to it. But it's also interesting because Mendelssohn um, was uh, a Jewish composer, um, which came with a certain amount of anti-Semitism against, uh, against him, especially during the Nazi regime. And so his um, importance and his legacy as a composer has been um, under question ever since he was alive. And so I really like his music. And so I'm championing that here. Uh, the work explores a lot of religious aspects and contains within it um, some quotations of famous hymn music. So Mendelssohn, as I said, was Jewish, but he, um, of course, lived in a time where you wasn't, he wasn't necessarily able to be um, practicing. Um, so I've included that work here. The next work is well and truly from the Romantic period, which is very much a 19th century uh, tradition in music, painting, poetry. And it is uh, Johannes Brahms' first symphony from 1854. Uh, Brahms was um, famous for, especially in this symphony, for uh, trying to uh, deal with Beethoven's legacy. So Beethoven famously wrote the Nine Symphonies and died after the Ninth Symphony. And the Ninth Symphony is, of course, a huge symbol in Western art music and in humanity and creativity in general. And Brahms really took this pressure to heart. He spent a long time um, before he wrote his first symphony because he said that, like, the the ghost of Beethoven was just so um, overwhelming to him. So he writes this really amazing first symphony. It's also important because around that time um, is the birth of what we call programmatic music. So what that means is that, say a composer starts to write a symphony uh, and the composer decides to theme it about um, taking a walk out in the countryside, which Beethoven did in his famous sixth symphony, the pastoral. Uh, that became almost a sort of political, um, artistic decision. Up until then, music had formed, had served a purpose that was about entertainment and was uh, entertainment or academic. And so it was um, a very abstract thing. You created music um, to be music. Beethoven comes along with his symphony and he sort of opens this new can of worms where composers can explore um, creating ideas, images, character, drama through music. Of course, opera does that in a way, but you've got a very clear theatre um, purpose there where a person is singing and telling a story through words. Um, this was very different because it was about making the instrumental sounds um, replicate or uh, impersonate or depict um, more theatrical ideas. Uh, so Brahms didn't do that. He was not interested in programmatic music. And so his music is very much a reaction against that, that push. Um, the composers that were for programmatic music would be someone like Hector Berlioz in France, uh, or of course, famously Richard Wagner in Germany, who was writing operas. So there was a, a reason for that music to be programmatic. Um, Berlioz was writing uh, famously um, the Symphony Fantastique, but many other orchestral works that explored theatre and um, storylines and depicted all sorts of things from like witches and um, uh, nightmares and all sorts of crazy things in his music. So Brahms is sort of a reaction against that and he wanted to write just um, music for the purpose and um, uh, for the sake of music. The next composer I've included is interesting because again, like Beethoven, they're a very transitional person. And it's Gustav Mahler, famous um, composer from Central Europe uh, around the turn of the century. I've included his fourth symphony from 1901, mostly because I think it is the most approachable work that he wrote. He wrote really amazing, huge, long symphonies. And like Beethoven, was interested in the technological advances and the technical advances of playing. Um, and so the works are longer, they're bigger, they've got more instruments in them than they've ever had before. And um, there's new sounds. He also wrote at times, not all the time, but at times programmatically. So 
um, some of the works. Um, there's a, a symphony called the Resurrection Symphony, which deals with the idea of someone um, dying and how they move to heaven and, and the idea of a soul and what your soul's life is on this earth. Um, the fourth symphony deals with um, many different things, but like childhood and and the, his his children. Mahler has this thing in his music where um, he's kind of obsessed with childhood death. Um, he experienced the death of his two daughters tragically when they were quite young, but also lived, of course lived in a time where childhood mortality was. Um, very high and so he would have been surrounded by friends and colleagues who had young children that died. Um, so I find that interesting because it's like another turning point about politics in a way and we're starting to see um, the exploration of, of that in his music. Um, Mahler of course was famous for uh, being involved in a, in a movement of art that really pushed um, art from the 19th century and the post-romantic period into the 20th century. So as I said, he's very transitional and you can hear in his music, um, it isn't just um, pretty beautiful sounds. He's also interested in, in darkness and um, angularity, which becomes very important in the 20th century. The final work of my like old stuff list is again a very important work and very transitional and one that you may know at least the story of and that is Igor Stravinsky's Rite of Spring from 1913, premiered in France. Famously there was a huge riot at it. It was written as a ballet, so it, again it's more kind of theatre music but often now it's played just as an orchestral piece in concerts. And it is huge, it is wild. Again, it is a huge leap forward in technical proficiency of um, the uh, how we play instruments and uh, what those instruments in the orchestra are. Uh, so uh, yeah, it really brought in the modernism and 20th century ideas into the concert hall uh, and caused a huge riot. Up until this point, all of the composers except Stravinsky and Monteverdi have been German extraction composers. So I really wanted to make sure that um, the newer works that I suggest were from as varied different uh, approaches and backgrounds as possible. Now that's not to say that um, pre-20th century there isn't composers that are amazing that aren't German. There's tons, you know, there's incredibly amazing Russian music, there's English, it's of all places there's amazing music. Um, but I wanted to kind of pick the the important um, works of the canon that uh, are a good way to be introduced to different approaches and styles, um, works that are concerti, works that are uh, symphonies, etc. Um, so this other list, the newish list, uh, is a little bit more mixed bag of genders, cultures, approaches, ideas. So the first work I would suggest would be by the Hungarian composer Bela Bartok uh, from 1936. It's a piece called Music for Strings, Percussion and Celeste. And it's a amazing work of um, the changing what the orchestra is. So going back to what I was talking about with the Mannheim Orchestra, you can see that um, influence all the way up to Stravinsky of what the Mannheim Orchestra is. It's a large string section with a group of woodwind players, a group of brass players and some percussion instruments. Um, and occasionally maybe a piano or a harp to colour um, the music. What Bella Bartok does in this piece is he takes the string section, but he adds a really big percussion section. He adds harp and um, as a kind of soloist, and he also adds this instrument of the celeste, which is a little keyboard instrument that strikes bells. Um, and that player also plays a piano part as well. And that was quite revolutionary because we'd never really had percussion as its own uh, section within the orchestra that played material that was integral to the work. Often percussionists were just sort of there at the back, hitting a triangle, playing a drum and creating a little bit of sort of fairy dust on the music. Um, as we move into the 20th century, percussion becomes more and more integral to the way that pieces work. Uh, he also splits the orchestra in half, the strings in half. So you have two different groups and that creates all sorts of really cool 
um, sort of musical images. So there's like mirroring going on. There's um, there's kind of like a uh, a stereo effect of the orchestra battling each other, playing against each other, with each other. It's a really really fantastic piece. Bartok brings together a really vibrant modern um, rhythmic language, um, and then he also brings in folk material from his native Romania and Hungary, um, and then he brings in. Uh, a level of sophistication with the harmony that um, creates these really amazing pieces. And so I would like, uh, my suggestion is you know, Music for Strings, Percussion and Celeste. The next work, we're actually jumping from the 30s all the way to the, 80, uh, to the 80s with Sofia Gulbaidulina, a, a violin concerto called um, Offertorium. Um, Gulbaidulina, I think, um, and listening to Gulbaidulina in the context of the previous work of Bartok and Stravinsky, with that matter, is interesting because she was a um, uh, composer working in the Soviet Union at the end of the Soviet Union. So through the 70s and the 80s and through the 90s, um, this work is from the mid 80s. And she was an experimental musician and was really interested in shaking up the Soviet Union music scene. Um, and really uh, rallied against the conservatism. So I think it's really important to listen to her music as an activist, but also she wrote amazing, cool music. Um, she did move to Germany, I believe, and worked there. Um, I'm not sure whether that was, I think that was after the fall of the Berlin Wall, but yeah, she was an incredibly um, brave and amazing musician. This piece, as I said, uh, for a solo violin, and strings, and it just has some really wild, cool sounds that you might not have heard before. Another work from the 80s um, I wanted to include is by famous Australian composer Peter Sculthorpe. It's called Earth Cry. It's important because um, it's probably the most well-known internationally, one of the most well-known works by an Australian composer, which of course, as an Australian, I want to champion that. Um, but it also is important because it depicts natural sounds and um, a sort of sense of the natural world under threat. And I think politically that's, of course, very important in the world that we're living in at the moment. And it shows that orchestras can um, do more than just make pretty sounds and that they can stand for something and that musicians and composers can um, say something with their art, which I think is really important. It also kind of has this sort of Australian um, imagery of the Australian outback, which um, is, of course, hard to depict in music. But yeah, I think everyone would, especially if you're Australian, be interested in how he tries to create that sound. Uh, the next work, I'm jumping back to the 60s, and this might be one that people who are lovers of classical music might go, why are you including this work and this composer, what are you talking about? You're crazy, what is going on? Well, Bernard Herrmann uh, and his amazing score to the 1960 Hitchcock film, Psycho. <coughs> like super famous, super famous. Almost, I would argue, probably as famous as Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, you know, dun, 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 dun. like people know that. Children, like, who of course have never seen the movie, probably do it at school to each other. You know, everyone knows the psycho shower scene. Like it's just embedded in Anglo-Western culture. So I wanted to include Bernard Herrmann because he's like a part of the zeitgeist. Um, but also he is a damn good composer and he wrote really amazing music. And because he's a film scorer, he's often sidelined and film scorers, and even saying that a film scorer, he's a composer. Um, they're often not given uh, the opportunity and the, the prestige that we give composers who write for the concert hall. And so I wanted to make sure that I included a composer who wrote for film because it's like most of the orchestral music that people would know would be film music. Star Wars, for instance, you know, Indiana Jones, like John Williams music, Bernard Herrmann, um, so many composers with famous, famous music. 
and it has kept the orchestra relevant, it has kept the orchestra employed, it's kept the orchestra alive in the 20th century, um, but also it has created a whole new art form um, where the orchestra isn't just a concert piece, it isn't just an accompaniment to an opera, uh, it is now an integral part of um, popular mass culture. And so I wanted to acknowledge that and also acknowledge that there has been some incredibly important, amazing, groundbreaking music written for films. And Bernard Herrmann is one of the absolute best. Um, I think it's also, I'm gonna actually do a video about film, listening to film scores, but I think it's worth, like, if you're a lover of music, to listen to film scores away from the films. Um, if you're a composer or a musician, or anyone, but especially if you're a person who makes music, it's so fascinating to listen to these works and analyse them um, outside of the visual context. The final work I suggest is a modern piece. It was written in 2014. It's called Mannequin, and it is by the Korean composer Unsuk Chin. Uh, Unsuk has um, an incredible career. Uh, she is commissioned by the top orchestras in the world and she's working at that top echelon of classical music uh, and this is a really fantastic work. She comes very much from a German way of thinking about music and a, she was trained in Germany um, but of course is a Korean and so has a very interesting place where she can bring um, those two worlds together in her music. It's also a good example of kind of where orchestral music is at at the moment um, and will give you an indication of the sort of sounds and um, the way that the orchestra is treated in a contemporary way. So I hope that was interesting to you. I hope that you can listen to some of these pieces and you can hear within it. Um, what I love with this cross section is it shows you where humanity in Western art music has sort of come from and where they are at now. Um, the changes in technology, the changes in artistic um, approach, the changes in um, what purpose music and music makers play um, in the world, uh, which I find really fascinating on top of just beautiful music. Um, so have a listen, like, comment, share, subscribe to my channel, and I'll be back next week with a, another classical music related video. Bye.